The following is intended solely for the use of those with a sense of adventure. I'm shaking the dust of this town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. This is Travel with Hawkeye. Here's your host, Mark Hawkeye Lewis. Today on the Travel with Hawkeye podcast, we talk with author Mark Adams. A couple of months ago, I actually had Mark on the podcast because he wrote a book called uh, Tip of the Iceberg. And I, I highly recommend that book if you are headed up to Alaska on a cruise anytime soon. And uh, by the way, Mark, I've sold a few copies of your book. I've uh, recommended it to quite a few people. <laughs> I love it. Uh, anyway, after I read that book, I went back into your catalog and thought, man, I'd like to read some more uh, that you've done. And I read Turn Right at Machu Picchu. And I'm going to be honest with you, you've kind of shot a hole in my bucket list because I would have been very happy to take the train up to Machu Picchu and call it a day and knock it off my bucket list. But after reading your book, I've totally changed what I would like to do if I ever get a chance to go to Peru. Well, that's the thing about Machu Picchu is, you know, most people who are there to get their shot for Facebook or Instagram, you know, they just want to get up there, take their picture, maybe have a quick look around and and go back down and have lunch. What they neglect to learn is that, you know, Machu Picchu is this very, you know, important historic site in this incredibly beautiful location that the Incas quite deliberately picked because they were brilliant engineers and landscape architects. And it's also, you know, connected via the Inca Trail and other sight lines, uh, you know, to other sites throughout the Cusco area. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in Machu Picchu that you cannot see just on a first glance. If you're thinking about taking a trip to Machu Picchu, I highly recommend this book, Turn Right at Machu Picchu, because it not only talks about the history and Incas and the uh, Spanish and what happened to it, but also talks about, uh, it's, it's like three books in one, because you also talk about Hi- uh, Hiram Bingham, the uh, Yale lecturer who discovered, and I say that in air quotes, we'll talk about that in a little bit, it talks about him discovering it in 1911, and then it also talks about your uh, adventure to retrace his steps and uh, what you discovered, and if I could preface this, and I don't mean any offense to this, you are by no means, uh, you would not bill yourself as an adventurer, I guess. I think you said you've no, never I even been camping before. <laughs> before writing the book, I had never been camping. The, the term martini explorer, I believe, <laughs> comes up more than once. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I was quite the tenderfoot, never was in the Boy Scouts. So not only was it my first serious camping trip, but I was doing it in some of the most extraordinary territory in the world. This was a very long trip to retrace his steps with guides and mules and camping out in extremely difficult terrain. I think uh, there were some areas, it was like you maybe traveled two or three miles and it took you all day to go that distance because it was up and down and high in the, uh, in the mountains. Well, what makes this area so incredible is it's where the Andes, which get up to 20,000 feet and, and above, crash into the Amazon in a very short period of time. That's why, you know, Machu Picchu is believed to be sort of a a sacred spiritual area because these two regions are just sort of smashed into each other. And yeah, if you're going on foot, you know, you can walk through four seasons in one day. You can see snow, rain, you know, brown fields, and then, you know, have have lunch under, you know, a tropical palm tree and it's 95 degrees out. So there's, you know, there's so much change so quickly in the topography there in the, the sort of Cusco region of Peru around Machu Picchu. And, you know, that is just part of what makes it such a special place. Well, let's first talk about Machu Picchu. There's a lot of debate about what it is. Is it a, Was it a summer palace for an Incan ruler, or was it a fortress? Or was it the famed mythical lost city of the Incas? And there's still debate to what it actually is. Well, there's two schools of thought in general. You know, the idea that it was the lost city of the Incas has kind of fallen by the wayside. That was Hiram Bingham, the fellow who rediscovered it in 1911. You know, that was his theory, and that was kind of a way his way of making himself seem more important, more of a world historical figure. In general, it's believed that it was sort of a Camp David of the Inca emperor, where he would go during the summer months, which of course are our winter months in the Southern Hemisphere, and, you know, he would go there for a few months at a time and he would bring his whole panaca or, or extended family there. The more interesting theory, which is put out by the anthropologist and explorer Johann Reinhard, who's the guy who found that Inca mummy on the top of a mountain about 20 years ago, is that it's, Machu Picchu is a sacred center. You know, that there are all these other sites that connect by sight lines and, you know, angles connect and the sunrise comes up in a particular spot and shines in various places. And so Machu Picchu is is sort of this heightened area 
very specifically built on this bluff overlooking the Urubamba, which is the sacred river of the Inca Empire. And, you know, to me, that's much more interesting because in that case, the Inca Trail is not just a pretty path that goes up and down some old ruins. You know, it's actually a pilgrimage site that was perhaps even a, a holy pilgrimage from the, the Inca, you know, capital city of Cusco to Machu Picchu. That's the interesting thing, too, is, and I discovered in your book, and a lot of people may think that, you know, Machu Picchu is it. You go to Peru, and that's it. That's the the one Inca, Inca site. But there's really many, many sites to be discovered. Oh, absolutely. Even in, in Cusco alone, you know, you've got Sacsayhuaman, which is absolutely enormous. What's left of it, you know, the descriptions we have from when the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century, you know, make it sound like it was the size of an aircraft carrier and, you know, much more imposing. It's still incredible. You know, there are there are blocks in the walls that are the sizes of, you know, camper vans and refrigerators, you know, perfectly set together by the Incas so that you can't even slip a credit card between the rocks. And remember, the Incas did not have of iron tools. The Incas did not have draft animals, so they did all of this with mathematics and, and human labor. So once you get around Machu Picchu, you've got, you know, Fuyu Patamarca, you've got, you know, Sayak Marca, you've got all these incredible old ruins in the region around Machu Picchu. So Machu Picchu is, you know, far and away the most beautiful, but there are, you could spend a month in the area around Machu Picchu and, and spend a different day at a different site and see something absolutely fantastic. And is there the possibility that there's stuff that has totally not been discovered yet? There is. You know, every year or two, because Machu Picchu is, is, you know, built in a cloud forest, and, you know, that'll grow over in a year or two if it's not cut back, you know, they'll find small buildings, they'll occasionally find relics, artifacts, pieces of pottery. You know, there's a a sister site to Machu Picchu called Choque Quirau, which I visit in the book, and... Ten years ago or so, they found an entire set of terraces with, you know, llamas built into the the faces of the terraces as decoration that went all the way down the mountainside to the river. So there, you know, there are still enormous things hiding out in the uh, Peruvian cloud forest. And now that they've started using LIDAR and things like that, which is sort of a form of radar that can find, you know, stone in the jungle. I believe they found something down in uh, Honduras not too long ago. A lot of these things may start cropping up sooner rather than later. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, let's talk about Hiram Bingham. He is a Yale lecturer in 1911. He goes to Peru, and it, it was his second trip to Peru. Is that correct? I can't remember if it was his second or third. It, it was certainly his first trip to Peru with a definite mission in mind. And his mission was to find that lost city of the Incas that we talked about before. It was known in the old Spanish chronicles written by the Spanish priests who followed the conquistadors like Pizarro in the 16th century. It was written up as Vilcabamba. So he's looking for, you know, Vilcabamba, the city to which the last Inca emperor escaped. And, you know, there are rumors that he brought gold with him. You know, I don't know how much Bingham bought into those, but he's, he's looking for this lost city. And, you know, he finds Machu Picchu, you know, pretty much by mistake. He's going down the Urubamba River that I mentioned before along a path. And, you know, it's a pretty tough territory. And he stops at an inn, I believe, July 24th, 1911. And the innkeeper says, you know, there's some pretty cool ruins up there on this bluff. <laughs> you might want to check them out tomorrow. And, you know, Bingham's like, okay, well, that sounds like a good idea. I think he, he probably was tipped off beforehand. Uh-huh. Seems to have, you know, uh, inflated the drama of the moment when he was there. But what happens is he gets to the top. He's carrying a camera. You know, this is 1911. Not everybody is. And he sees that this it, there's this extraordinary site on top of this thing. And there are two or three families living there, farming in the ruins of what we now know is that famous shot of Machu Picchu, you know, sort of unrolling out in front of you, the green with the white buildings. And he takes these photos and he realizes right away what he's got. He's like, this is the find of a lifetime. And he goes back and National Geographic magazine, which is just getting, you know, its legs under itself, says, hey, we're going to give you some money. We want you to go back there and start excavating, clean this place up, and start trying to explain what it actually was. And he basically really made National Geographic magazine. It was a very small magazine before they'd had this expedition. They had really just started finding their way. They had a, a new editor named Gilbert Grosvenor, a young, ambitious guy. And he'd done some, some interesting stuff. They'd done an issue on Tibet that was kind of phenomenal. But what they did with Machu Picchu was Grosvenor 
said, look, we're going to make this a whole issue. That's the first time they did that. They did a whole fold out, uh, almost like Playboy, <laughs> uh, you know, picture of the ruins of Machu Picchu, four pages. If you find one of these things on eBay now, it's several hundred dollars. It was, I think the front page, if, if anybody wants to go up to their garage, as everybody tends to do and say, you know, I'm going to go through these old National Geographics. If you find one that says in the wonderland of Peru on the front, Hold on to it because you may be paying for a chunk of somebody's college education. Yeah, but before you go searching through those, this came out in the 1900s, early 1900s, 19, <laughs> yeah, 1912, 13, was, something like that. It was 1913. Okay, exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so unless your collection goes Machu Picchu on the map, and yeah. that's what put Hiram Bingham on the map. Yeah, now, and he was really searching for this, but this was the era of great explorers and great adventurers. So, I mean, this was a really a path to fame, was it not? It was. Remember, this is the exact moment when people are racing for the South Pole, you know, 1911. Amundsen is racing Scott to get there first. The North Pole had just been visited for the first time. Someone had sailed around the world, I think, for the first time solo. And, you know, Bingham very much wanted to be a part of that. And because he found Machu Picchu, he was. There There was a dinner at the National Geographic Society uh, a year or two after he got to Machu Picchu, and there's a photograph of him with Admiral Byrd of North Pole fame and Roald Amundsen of South Pole fame. And it's, you know, these three great explorers together just celebrating this last moment of uh, the age of exploration before World War I brings that to a close. You know, it's interesting, too, is, you know, it's Originally, it was termed that he discovered Machu Picchu, but now as we look back, it's like, how can you discover something where people are living there, farming it? And so some people knew it was there, but not really very many people. I mean, it wasn't like the government of Peru knew it was there and, and people were trekking up there. Very few people knew about it. No, it was locally known. What he did was he made it known to the world at large. And by doing so, he probably preserved Machu Picchu because this is a, a great time of what they call uh, waqueros, the grave robbers. And, you know, when he had been at Chokikirao two years prior and where he had first heard this story of the lost city of the Incas, you know, they were blowing up ancient Inca buildings with dynamite looking for gold underneath. So, you know, this is not a time when, you know, necessarily 400-year-old buildings were considered archaeological treasures. They were considered, you know, puzzles to be solved so that you could find the, the pottery and the gold underneath that you could sell for, to make your own fortune. But Bingham, you know, he's a complicated man. So we have him to thank for Machu Picchu. If you go to Machu Picchu today, and many people will, you've got Bingham to thank for that. Yeah, I, I really believe that, too. And I thought I think I read in your book, too, that there's a museum there, and I believe it's in Cusco or somewhere near there, about Machu Picchu, and, and he's not even mentioned in the museum. Yeah, I haven't been back there in almost 10 years, but there is a museum at the, the foot of the bluff on which Machu Picchu sits. And yeah, there's no photo of him. There's really, I think, maybe one mention of him. And this is, you know, a rather large museum, several rooms. And that's partly because the people who were in charge of Peru 10, 15 years ago when this museum was going up really did not like Bingham very much. They wanted to put the emphasis back on the Peruvians. So, you know, the displays there tend to talk about the innkeeper who sent him up the hill and the guy in Cusco who may have tipped him off beforehand. You know, there's, there's a lot of glory to go around in Machu Picchu. Bingham is just the most famous person. Yeah, and I think it could be argued, too, like you said, that if it wasn't for him, it would have, you know, it could have been lost forever to the jungle and uh, he actually brought the world's attention to it and saved it in that manner. Yeah, by publicizing it, he saved it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But it's also interesting in your book uh, that you mentioned this, and I'd never heard this story before, uh, about another person who, uh, air quotes, discovered it, but he discovered it years before, but mainly he was taking treasures out and, as you said, being a grave robber. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, the story of the German. His name escapes me at the moment. But in the 19th century, there seemed to be a German in, in Peru who had bought the rights to the area around Machu Picchu and was probably taking artifacts out of there so that they could be sold. Certainly when Bingham came in 1911, 1912, he went to a hacienda nearby called Huadquina and I believe almost certainly was buying artifacts that had been stolen from Machu Picchu. So when it came time a few years ago for Yale to give back all of the stuff that they had taken out of Machu Picchu during Bingham's archaeological digs, which had been in the Peabody Museum in New Haven for almost 100 years, I think they're allowed to hold on to the stuff that Bingham bought on the black market because that's technically just stuff that he bought privately. 
So, you know, people have been pulling stuff out of Machu Picchu for a long, long time. There isn't a whole lot of treasure, treasure that has been found there. I think maybe like one gold bracelet, maybe an earring or two. That's about it. It's the building them, themselves that are the treasure of Machu Picchu. The interesting thing about Hiram Bingham is, uh, in your theory, he is the model for Indiana Jones. You know, I, I trace this back with the help of a, a researcher named Ryan Bradley, and it seems that the Indiana Jones books were largely based, not entirely, but largely based on a movie called Secret of the Incas starring Charlton Heston that came out, I think, in the early 1950s. He, my, my friend, the researcher, found earlier drafts of the storyline for that, and it was basically a ripoff of Bingham's 1948 rewrite of the story of Machu Picchu, uh, which was called Lost City of the Incas. It got less and less so as the iterations went on. They probably got cold feet that Bingham was going to sue them or something. But definitely, there is a lot of Hiram Bingham's DNA in Indiana Jones. It's interesting, too, because I actually watched that movie. I went and found it on YouTube, and Indiana Jones is wearing basically the exact same thing as Charlton Heston is wearing in that 50s movie, and I thought that was very amusing. Yeah, and, you know, that famous scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where he's got the pole and they're looking for the lost city of Tannis on the, you know, the model and the beam comes through. You know, that that is so close to a shot in uh, Secret of the Incas that it can only be an homage sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek homage from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. So, you know, like I said, there, there's a lot of stuff that came out of Secret of the Incas, and a lot of Secret of the Incas originally came out of Bingham's book. And, and speaking of that, actually, there is something very similar to the light coming through a certain area, because during the winter solstice, uh, on one day, light will come through a certain window there at Machu Picchu. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. There's a, an Alaskan amateur researcher named Paolo Greer who pointed this out to me that, you know, not long ago, a new source of history uh, that deals with um, Pachacutec, the emperor who had Machu Picchu constructed, was found. And it said, you know, look, there may have been some sort of statue at Machu Picchu. And what Paolo pointed out was, look, on the 21st of June, on the solstice there, the light comes up over a particular peak, it's the longest day of the year, and it sort of, once it clears the peak, this beam of light shoots down through a window in the most famous building at Machu Picchu, which is called the Torreon, and it shines this sort of rectangular block of light on this rock that almost looks like the the base of a trophy where the figurine has been cracked off. You know, Paolo's theory is that there was a statue of Pachacutec, the emperor, in there. You know, we're never going to know, although Paolo has his theories. Paolo has a lot of interesting theories. But it's possible that this was constructed by the Incas in the the 1400s, so that this beam of light on the holiest day of the year would shoot through and and illuminate this statue of Pachacutec. It's it's a wonderful idea. I I just don't know if we'll ever be able to prove it. Well, it's kind of interesting. I sent you a link about this. Franciscan friars, when they built missions in San Antonio, and this has been discovered in other missions, use something very similar they call it illumination where light would come through a certain window like for instance on the feast of assumption a light would come through a certain window in the mission and shine on a painting of the virgin mary as a way to show the indigenous people at the mission the power of god the light of god coming through and yeah. uh, and so you know i wonder now after you know i just put this together i wonder if the franciscans got this from the incans Oh, I don't know. I mean, there are cathedrals like that all throughout Spain that I remember seeing when I did part of the Santiago Trail. On the certain days of the year, the light would shine through certain places. There's a 5,000-year-old temple on Malta in the Mediterranean where on the solstice, light will shoot down certain corridors. You know, remember, people go to Stonehenge Uh on the solstice and the the equinoxes and, you know, light uh, shines in various places there. I think it's just a worldwide effect. I think, you know... Cultures around the world have always reverence for the sun, and they realize that on these most important days, when they they say, you know, look, the, the sun is at its strongest point today, let's construct buildings to reflect that. But who knows? I mean, who knows where the original idea came from? I will say this is my theory that electricity ruined all this. Uh, we stopped doing that when we got electric lights. <laughs> it's a little less impressive. Yeah, we'll just flip the switch. Well, the great thing about the book Turn Right at Machu Picchu, as I said before, it's really three different stories in one. It's the story of the Incas, it's the story of Bingham, and then it's the story of your adventure 
in Peru where you decided to retrace the steps, a couple different trips to Peru. And as I said earlier, and you admit you're a martini explorer, you are not even a Boy Scout. Yes. But this was a, I mean, I read your adventures here and it's like, wow, this is a, there were some dangerous hikes. There were hikes in the snow. There, you had to take mules, and this was quite an adventure, especially for someone who is just a regular dad from the suburbs of New York City. Well, that's what was really surprising to me, was that you get to Cusco, which is a fairly cosmopolitan town, you know, 25, 30 miles outside of Cusco, it could be 200 years ago. You know, there's people planting potatoes with sticks. There are wild animals walking around you got to watch out for. The jungle is completely grown over. There are just these tiny paths that go through the mountains, the same paths that the Incas themselves used 500 years ago. You know, there are old Inca trails made of stone that look like it could be the, the roads leading to Rome. So you can get pretty far out pretty quickly. You know, luckily for me, John Lieber is my Australian guide who has been going throughout this country for the last 30 years. And uh, who was actually just at my house a few weeks ago. I saw that on Twitter. <laughs> yep, yeah, he was here. For the first time, he'd never been to an REI before. He was very excited. <laughs> you know, and, and he's the Indiana Jones of this story. I mean, he is an amazing character, your guide, an Australian gentleman who took you throughout uh, Peru. Does he still uh, live in Peru, or what's up with him? He spends half the year in Peru and half the year in Perth, Australia, on the west coast of Australia. And he's, what's he doing right now? I think he's looking at some smaller towns along what used to be the Long Inca Trail. Last summer, he, with a group from California, I believe, walked all the way from Quito, Ecuador, to Cusco, following the route of the old Inca Trail. Um, and some of it is completely abandoned country, and some of it is highways going through busy cities because you yeah. know, when you're going to build a highway, you might as well just take the old trail yeah. and pave on top of it. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a sort of a mixed bag. But, yeah, he's, you know, he had a heart attack when uh, we were down there, and he got sewn up, and he's still, you know, riding his bike through the Andes and walking off in all sorts of directions and, uh, you know, going into places where you even have to bring your own water in. So, yeah, he's the real deal. Yeah, he really it was a, it was fascinating. And there's one part of the book where, uh, and I agree with you. He uh, he was chopping through some uh, some growth in the jungle, and a branch hit him in the face and it almost tore out his eye socket. And it was oh my, <laughs> oh my gosh, it was very difficult to even read. And I think you said it best. Like if that happened with you, you'd have to pump you up with morphine and pull you out of there. <laughs> and he was like, "Let's just exactly. wait till the morning. Pour some water, and it will be good to go." If that's basically what happened. He, you know, we went through a, a long, unpleasant evening, and then the next day he got up and he walked around with his eye closed for a day, and he never mentioned it again. <laughs> you know, whereas if, if, if it had been me, it would, it would, you know, I would have had like ten eye surgeons on the sat phone, you know, <laughs> saying, you know, fly me out. I need to get to New York City right away. Get a helicopter. You know? Get this sewn up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah get an F fourteen in here. Yeah, he is a fascinating character and a great part of the book. And it, like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed the book, Turn Right at Machu Picchu. And I highly recommend, if this is on your bucket list, to go to Machu Picchu. Read this book before you go because it'll make your trip so much better. In fact, there's something in the book that I'll close on this. There's a back way to Machu Picchu that most people don't even know about. There is. There's a back door to Machu Picchu, and if they end up putting in a road in an airport that they're talking about out there, it's going to ruin it forever. So check out the book and check out that secret route, and uh, you'll have bragging rights that no one else will be able to have in a few years. Well, Mark, before I let you go, what is your next adventure? I don't know yet. I'm trying to figure that out right now. You know, it's kind of funny because I was trying to think. I thought, well, if I could make, if I could end this by giving Mark a suggestion, he would go, oh, that would be perfect. <laughs> but I really just couldn't think of anything that would come up with a, that would equal your last two because there's a historic aspect. The only thing that was even close is retracing the steps of uh, Lewis and Clark, but I don't know if that would be... I mean, so much of that is urbanized and paved over, and I don't know if that would be exactly uh, tripped, you know. So, anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed both of the last two books I read, Mark, and I really appreciate the time today. Oh, my pleasure, Hawk, and uh, congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> No problem. Take care, and I'll, I'll let you know when the next one's coming out. Let me close by saying, if you go to our website, TravelWithHawkeye.net, click on our blog. I'll have links to the movie we talked about, Secret of the Incas, and also uh, links to the illuminations that were found at the San Antonio Mission, and some other things also that you might find interesting uh, about Machu Picchu. Uh, man, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Mark's. This is the second book we've reviewed here on uh, Travel with Hawkeye, and I cannot wait to read his next adventure, though it probably will be some time. You've been listening to the Travel with Hawkeye podcast. I'm Mark Hawkeye Lewis.